Hey everyone, so welcome to part one of my DevOps Masterclass. I put out a poll on my channel a little while ago saying, hey, what should I work on next as kind of a big project? And a DevOps Masterclass was kind of the most popular by far topic, so that's what we're doing. Um, this does kind of go, I have other masterclasses on my channel like the PowerShell Masterclass and the Azure Masterclass. This will follow the same format. I want it to be kind of relaxed. There's a playlist where I'll have all the videos. I'll try and add one a week. Sometimes there might be a bigger gap if I have another topic I kind of want to put in the middle. There's a GitHub repo for the slides, um, the whiteboard, the code that goes with it. But I'm really just trying to transfer the knowledge over. There's a lot of work that goes into these. So please, if it is useful, give it a like, subscribe, comment and share and hit the bell icon. So you'll be notified when I add new kind of lessons to this, when I maybe add supplementary or I change something. So my goal for this, now the structure, I have some PowerPoint, but it will vary week by week. Like I'll do a lot of whiteboarding mainly, but when I'm talking about maybe a certain technology, like next week I'm gonna cover really a master Git. That's nearly gonna be all demo. So it won't be much whiteboarding it, I think there'll be no PowerPoint, it will just be demoing for the entire time. So it's gonna vary. But what I wanna really focus on is these key topics for DevOps. Now, obviously this is a recording, but I do kind of check the comments of my YouTube channel. I do not look at LinkedIn, I do not look at Twitter. None of those things will work if you tag me. Comment in the applicable video. So we're gonna really focus on sort of DevOps foundation. So that's this lesson. So gonna go kind of quickly over a lot of different areas. I'm gonna spend a bit more time on kind of some of the frameworks around the project management side because there's not other lessons on those, but really just introduce the all up concepts, really the goal behind DevOps. And then preliminary plans, next week will be mastering Git. So huge amounts of detail on becoming a master of Git. This applies to everyone and that's DevOps in general. This is not just developers, it's not just operations, it's not just architects everyone should kind of understand DevOps. It really is this universal thing right now. And then I actually want to look at some of the tooling, um, Azure DevOps, GitHub, how they differ, where they're going, what parts we might want to use. Think about continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, how pipelines play into that, why it's important. So I want to dive into those concepts. Thinking about handling secrets is actually a really important thing. We were talking about don't have secrets in your code, don't put them anywhere. So where do we put them? How do we handle secrets? We're gonna dive into that. Thinking about infrastructure as code, another really critical element to everything we're gonna do. Key to the pipelines, this declarative, this is what I want it to be, let's make sure it really is. Looking at containers, Kubernetes, images, image builder, repositories, registries, all of those types of things. Monitoring. Monitoring is huge to DevOps. Not just that traditional monitoring we think of for how busy is our server. Monitoring what are the interactions with our service. Monitoring what's the user behavior, what path do they take, what is their experience. And then GitOps. Um, and then security, all of these important topics. And this is just my preliminary thinking as I start to plan this out. I may absolutely add other things in here. I might move things around. As I'm gonna talk about, the playlist is really the source of truth. So technology changes. I will update modules over time. I might completely replace them. I might add ones in. I might add supplementary videos. So, I will reference and link to deeper dives in certain areas. Like I might have a whole video just on Key Vault while we'll go and reference that. So make sure to subscribe, hit the notification, you'll see those things. Use the playlist. Now it's in the description, as is the GitHub repo. Right now it's gonna be empty, but the playlist will have all of the key videos for the DevOps Masterclass. And the GitHub will have the whiteboard, the PowerPoint, the code, links to the videos, links to the additional learning. So they're gonna be your sources of truth. Now the question always comes up whenever I do the kind of any video or class, is this specific to some kind of certification? The answer is no, I'm not geared towards any particular cert. My focus is just to transfer the knowledge, 
make you digest the knowledge. However, it's definitely going to help with the Azure DevOps engineer. I obviously do come from an Azure background, for those that know my content. So I'm going to focus more on the Microsoft side of the house. So when I demo deployments, it will be to Azure. Now, the same concepts would apply to Google Cloud or AWS or on-premises. I'm going to show GitHub. But the same thing would work if I'm using a different Git repository. But certainly, it will help with that DevOps engineer. And so what I'll end each module with is kind of questions. Go ask in the comments below. But with that, I want to get to the first lesson, foundation. And the whole goal is really, well, what is DevOps? What are some of the key concepts we think about? And how, at the end of this session, you could start to get ready, thinking about things you could do now that will set you in good stead for the future lessons. Key part here, DevOps is not a product. Now, it's confusing because, yes, there is a product you can buy called Azure DevOps. But it's really much more than that. DevOps is a tool. Yes, it will help. I can use as much or as little as, it, as I want to. I don't have to use any of it. DevOps is more than just a single product. And I think it's summed up very well by Donovan Brown. He's kind of one of the lead evangelists around DevOps at Microsoft. And he kind of come up with this idea of what it is. So it's the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Now, the key word, value. Everything we're going to do around the DevOps is about delivering value for the business to our customers. And something that really sets the whole idea of DevOps apart from maybe other methodologies we've used in the past is this idea of continuous delivery. It's not these huge six months or one year product projects. It's these continual smaller increments of value that build on the previous increment. That's really what's going to kind of set this apart. Okay, so we know it's not a product. Why are we worrying? Why are we thinking about what is DevOps? What does it do? So before DevOps, we had the business. Now, our company is really focused around it's performing a certain business. And no matter what that business is, we want to deliver value to our customers. It doesn't matter what that type of business is. Fundamentally, we want to get value to our customers. That's how a company differentiates itself from its competitors. What is the value we can bring? Now, those customers could actually be employees. It might be an internal service. It could be external people, could be partners, but it's all about the value. So if I think about this for a second, uh, there's some important things that really kind of gel together. Now, I can think about the two other teams. We have kind of a business owner, product owner. We have developers. Developers want to create new stuff. That's really how they're gold, how they're paid. How much new stuff can you get out there? And then we have IT operations. They are given the code by the developer to put into production. And their goal is to keep things running, to keep things stable, to ensure that continual availability of the value. So I think about that for one second. Let's just compare those things. So I can think about, okay, what I have at the top is the idea of, well, yeah, it's, it's the business. So I can go, okay, so I have the business whose key focus, their guiding star, is to deliver value. Perfect. Then we have the idea that, okay, well, now we have over here the developers. And their shining star, their goal is to really introduce change. That's probably how they're gold, how they're rewarded. Okay. Over here, we have kind of operations. And their kind of guiding star is stability. 
i.e. no change. And you can start to see a, a problem kind of straight away. You have these conflicting goals that are generally just going to put them in conflict straight away. Developers want to put in change. Hey, we're gold on how many new things we can do. Operations, you're gold on keeping things running, making sure it's stable. They, they don't like each other. We, operations doesn't like developers. You keep trying to change stuff. Developers, are oh, you're impeding our ability to change and do fantastic new things. Now, additionally, when I think about this, the motivations were very different because the developers are rewarded on change. Operations are motivated on keeping the lights on. Also, the developers, for the most part, we can think about, well, they just create the code and pass it over. If it gets into production and doesn't run very well, eh, they, they don't really have that big a deal. Yes, they have to fix it at some point, but they're not really on the hook. Additionally, we can think about those projects we have over here. The projects actually tend to be very long. So if I think about the business, kind of have some set of kind of requirements that maybe change over time, but they have the requirements are kind of gathered at the start. And then we have this huge long running project. This is a long time. And at the end of that long time, they actually get a delivery. And they don't really interact at any point in between. So hey, we get the requirements from the business, okay, and then there's this huge long project. It could take six months. If the customer's requirements changed at some point, there's no provision for that. I can't go back and get that. And if at the end what's delivered is wrong, tough. There's really not a lot we can do. The other thing about traditionally our projects, we think about this very monolithic application. It's very tightly coupled together. If I try and change one piece, I have to make sure I go and I test all the other pieces as well. I can't really just change easily some item because I have this very tight coupling, calling, I need to know what the schema is that it's using internally, because I'm accessing that as well. So if you change that, I need to know and I need to change. It really prohibits the ability to change. So it slows everything down. If I change one thing, it'd be this huge cascading set of changes I'd have to make to a whole bunch of other things. So it really wasn't a great place to be. Okay. So, the goal, what we're trying to get to, as the name DevOps implies, it's really about trying to bring the people together. We want to try and get the operations, get the developers to better collaborate together. Now, obviously, you're still going to have individual teams. There's still going to be, for example, um, a network specialist team, a security team. But for the general kind of workings, what we want to try and do is really unite. We want to kind of bring things together. So the developers are invested in the quality of the code. They're, they're on the hook for that as well. When we think about this new cadence of, hey, we're going to deliver things quicker, it, it doesn't work if we've got these very isolated teams who still have these very conflicting goals. We want a shared success criteria. We want to deliver the value. We understand what the value is. The developers are involved in the complete flow. Even security, yes, we're going to have a security team. But you'll often hear about this thing called shifting left. The idea that instead of waiting until something goes into production live, and then we look at how secure it is by doing pen, penetration testing or whatever, we introduce security much, much earlier. Hey, as soon as we do that commit into some repository, there's some scans going on. As soon as we build a container image, there's scans going on. What are its dependencies? Maybe we, we run that thing. We issue pull requests to say, hey, look, we know you're using this dependency. There's issues with that. 
we recommend you take a dependency on this instead where that is fixed. So there's this whole idea of really building things in, unifying it earlier and earlier. Additionally, we can really think about there's going to be this idea around more self-deployment. If we're going to do this more frequent delivery, it really doesn't work where, hey, okay, I've written this thing. Okay, now go and deploy this to this small test environment. Let's check it still works. There's going to be this self-serve automated deployments. But when we do that, we still have requirements. As a company, I still have requirements. There might be regulatory requirements, where I can deploy, what sort of replication I need, um, what backups I have. So we have a governance, who can do what? Um, how much are you spending, budgets? There's still all those things that need to be there. And when I think about the teams, what we really wanna think about as much as possible is they are vertically structured around a certain skill set, a certain discipline that's going to help scale, i.e. a team around each element of the solution. Maybe it's the shopping cart team. Um, maybe there's some other element, but you want to align them as opposed to just a team of skilled data people or writing Java people. That makes it harder to collaborate. We're still going to have individual skills, but as a team, we want to be really focused on being able to deliver kind of that set of value. Okay, so when we think about bringing all these different things together, well, it's gonna require some new processes. Now that is gonna mean I require proper tooling. Like we're probably not gonna be able to use the same tooling we've used in the past because, hey, we're doing things in a new way. And I think about, okay, well, I want this new continuous cycle. I want to ensure this continued delivery of value. And that's going to do a lot of different things for us. One of the biggest ones, there's not going to be this huge gap anymore between the customer, either the app owner, the product owner, and seeing a result. So there's this huge gulf between where they can provide input. Instead, we want this continuous delivery. So I can think about, well, to sort of that great big horrible long project. I can instead think about a cycle. Now the exact steps may differ, but I can think about, well, we're gonna plan and track. So obviously at this point here, requirements can come in. Then obviously we have to develop. So we're gonna create something. It doesn't have to even be code. It could be new templates to deploy infrastructure. Maybe it's a resizing exercise. Then maybe there's something I need to build. Hey, some maybe final template, do something there. I'm definitely going to want to always do testing, kind of coming into whatever we're doing. I'll have some kind of release. So I've tested something, now I'm going to build a release. Maybe it's a container image. Um, maybe it's a new configuration file. It's GitOps, but there's some kind of release. Then I'm going to deploy that thing. Once it's deployed, well, it's not going to be operated, so it, it still has to have operation tasks running. And then what I need to do is kind of monitor and learn. That's a huge piece. And then that learning, that monitoring goes back in to the planning and the tracking for the next cycle. So what you kind of get in here is this idea of continuous improvement. I'm continually improving. I'm continually learning. I've got this cycle. So each cycle is giving me small incremental value. This is huge. That idea that I'm just constantly iterating and adding in value, but in what are fairly small steps. So I can think about this whole loop. This whole loop, so I think about a loop time. I want this fairly short because this kind of equals my speed to react. Because kind of once I've started a loop, 
I'm kind of invested in what I'm doing. If some new requirements came in, it's very hard to adjust in the loop. So I don't want these loops to take huge amounts of time. So we typically think kind of a few weeks it should take to get through a loop. Because then if hey, some new requirements comes in, it's not the end of the world. The loop only takes a couple of weeks, then we can get back in, we can get new things actually coming. So, it's a continuous cycle to actually ensure that continued delivery of value. But we say value, what do you work on? That word value can mean different things. And what I really care about is what is valuable to the end user, i.e. The, the, the final customer of whatever this solution is. Maybe it's what is causing the most pain. That is the most value. And if we think about that and all those different things, how do we know those things? Well, it's that monitoring and learning. When we say monitor, it's not just monitoring the CPU usage or the IOPS of a system. We still do that. We need to make sure we're sized correctly. It's monitoring the user behavior. What paths are they taking? What are they clicking? Where do they give up? I get that piece of information, that telemetry, that helps me adjust and create the right solution and know where I am focusing on. Also, the human interactions, I might want to get feedback from the customer. What do you like? What do you don't like? So there's a whole set of extra tooling. So when I think about this plan and track, what I'm really focusing on, where is most value? That's the key part. I'm going to have a whole list of things that I want to do. I'm going to have a product backlog and we'll talk about this. But the way I decide what's next to work on, no matter what my methodology, it's generally going to be what's going to give me the most value. I'm a business. I want to differentiate myself. I want to win. I want to be better than my competition. I need to make sure that I'm focusing on the right things. If I'm not focusing on the right things, then really, what's the point in that? So we want to make sure we're really understanding what is the most value. So we need good information coming in to make sure we, we know what is the right thing. Now there's going to be a shift in application architecture and hosting most likely as well. So remember before we had that big monolithic application. Well, that doesn't lend itself well to this continual improvement that we really want to do. I don't really like this. That is very hard for me to continually be improving on. That, that, that's hard to focus, it's hard to how to change a small thing to bring some small incremental value and not break a hundred other things. So what I think about moving to is what we want to get to is the idea of kind of these microservices. And the idea of we have this loose coupling. So instead of this big block, I have different services that, sure, there's going to be requirements and they're going to be communicating, but you'll hear things about like REST, communicating over URLs using common Git and put very, very common ways to communicate. I can expose those. It's a standard way for different components to talk but they don't need to know anything about internal structures or schemas. I can completely change the internals of this part. None of these need to know. They're interacting via loose coupling. It doesn't matter. I can now do what I want in here, and as long as that kind of fairly loose way of calling remains consistent, nothing else needs to know. So I don't want different components to care about the structures and internals of what other things are using. Now also, most likely, there's going to be shifts. As I start going to things like microservices, over here, I probably focused a lot on maybe virtual machines. That's super common. Over here, I'm going to start focusing on things like containers. And then I'll have an orchestrator like Kubernetes. The benefit of containers, I can spin them up 
and down super, super quickly. I can create a container sub-second. Does its job, it can go away. I can respond to changes super, super quickly. I'm not wasting resources by having all of these virtual machines, maybe not doing that much. There's less OS for me to manage. And that's another key part. I'm trying to get away from things that don't bring value. When I keep seeing the word over and over again, value, value. We want to do stuff that brings value to our company. Patching an operating system, worrying about antivirus and its firewall and its config is not bringing any value to our company. Making changes to our products and giving new functionality brings value. So the less management and a sort of um, ownership of things that I can give up that don't bring value, the better. I want to focus on my app and my code. So, so uh, things like containers, things like serverless. Hey, with serverless, there's some code I have, it's triggered by something. Maybe it's an event, maybe it's a schedule, maybe it's a webhook, whatever that might be, it just gets triggered. So I'm really shifting the responsibility to just the stuff I care about. And that, that is another kind of motion we're seeing. More and more things now are kind of shifting to the cloud. One of the big reasons for that well, is the availability of these types of services. If I think about the cloud, we have all these different very rich services. On premise, you probably have VMs. Maybe you have some containers. Maybe you have a database farm. In the cloud, there's Kubernetes services, there's managed database services, um, products, open source solutions, there's machine learning services, there's serverless, because then I only pay for the stuff I use. So that consumption basis is very attractive to companies because I'm only paying for what I use, which goes back to the idea Hey, microservices and auto scale. Hey, I'm busy at this moment. I need this many. Hey, I'm more quiet. I need this many. That's huge because now I can save money. So I super, super care about those things. So we see these kind of shifts happening in the environments. Okay, so that, that's kind of the goal. See the shift in the architecture, shift in the hosting. Let's make it a little bit more real waterfalls and kind of being agile. The whole process, um, the project manager, the project management we use is a huge piece of the continuous cycle. Now I'm gonna spend more time on this than any other section because I'm not really gonna go into this in other lessons in the course. All the other parts we're gonna have entire parts about. So waterfall used to be very popular. We had these large, very dependent phases of the project. I can think about this as, okay, let's get my board back, come on, what's going on? It's refusing to, there we go. So, if I think about, let's go over here for a second. So let's think, what is waterfall? So this was kind of the, the standard way, and we'll see why it's called waterfall. We have the customer, we always have the customer. This could be the product owner, business owner, whatever that is. They're the people that really know what they want. So the, the customer always has requirements. Now we do our best to understand those requirements as well as we can. Super important to get those. So we get the requirements and from those requirements, we do a design. So that's the user's interaction, that customer's interaction feeds into that. And then they're done. Because once the design is complete, we have to have the design complete first, then we can develop. Once the development is done, then we can test. Once the testing is done, well, we can deliver it. And as you can kind of guess why it's called waterfall is, well, it, it flows like a waterfall. Each of these kind of has to be complete before we can move to the next one. And if you think about the customer, their next interaction is 
is here. Okay, the requirements of this went. And this is a long time. Six months, maybe longer, depends what this is. Maybe the customer's happy at the end of this time. Maybe not. Maybe there was a misunderstanding. Maybe the customer's requirements have changed. Hey, six months a year is a long time, especially in modern business, that's a really long time. Maybe they had some new requirements. Well, if you think about, hey, they had this new requirement, if I'm here, can I easily incorporate that? No. So it's very rigid. And so what we end up with typically is a fairly unhappy customer because of that lack of interaction. It's very rigid. I maybe can work out things like costs fairly well and timeline fairly well, but it is a super rigid structure that takes a very long time. So generally, we're not going to end up with a super happy customer. So what can we do? So the idea here is, yes, that used to be very popular with these large dependent phases. Today, we're really thinking about moving to an agile mindset. Now, this whole agile mindset is built on kind of four key values. These are primary for everything we do with agile. It's really about these iterative delivery of small increments. We're constantly going to build additional value. And because we get these much, much smaller cycles, we can get feedback far more often. So if I think back, so if that was kind of waterfall, if I move over and now we think of Agile. So a core component of Agile are these small loops and then another loop. But it's building on the previous one. So each time the total solution is getting bigger because we're building on the previous work. So it's this constant incremental value. Now, each of these loops still has those same core phases. Hey, we do a design, we do a develop, we do a test, hopefully, most of the time, and we do a deliver. But they're all smaller. And a key part here is that that customer still exists, obviously. We still have the customer, but the customer's interactions now are constant. There's this constant interaction with what we're doing. And so I can think about the core tenant of Agile is kind of focused on the individuals and interaction. We want that constant communication within the team. I want it with the customer. It's about focusing on providing working software over, for example, comprehensive documentation. Now, you're going to see these things like individuals and interaction over process and tools. We want to make sure we're getting those good interactions. It doesn't mean the other things aren't important, they're just not as important working software over comprehensive documentation. I can think of customer collaboration over contracts. It's more important to collaborate with them over, you still need contracts, but that collaboration is more important than a contract negotiation. And we think about responding to change. over some fixed following a plan. Now, there, there are other things. If I jump over for a second, in addition to those kind of four key principles, and again, the link to this, let's jump over for a second, will actually be in kind of the, the GitHub. I have the links for all of this. But you can see it's, hey, these individuals and interactions over processes and tools. You can kind of see that right here. 
We can see the working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. And then also beyond that, what we can actually see as well is there are these 12 principles. You can go and, kind of go and click on those, but if you go to the 12 principles, it's all about customer satisfaction, welcoming, changing requirements, deliver working software frequently, business and developers working together, build projects around motivated in individuals, efficient and effective ways of working, working software, primary measure. And again, you may be kind of looking at this, going like, why are we spending so much time on this? Because this is run really the fundamental about DevOps. Yes, there's tooling. Yes, there's Git. Yes, there's CI, CD and images and all that other stuff. But if you don't understand the why we're doing these things, it's really not super useful. So it's critical we understand these things to understand why we're doing all of this in the first place. So I want to make sure we really understand those key components. Now within Agile, there's actually different methodologies. Now there's a lot of different frameworks. Um, I'm going to focus on two because I think they're kind of the main ones you're commonly going to see. So I'm, I'm going to just focus on those. So let's think about this for a second. So we have Agile. And again, there's two kind of, I don't know, flavors is the right word of this. But we're going to think about Scrum and we're going to think about Kanban. Now, Kanban is actually a few different things which can confuse things, um, but I'll explain that as kind of we go along. Now, both of these things actually start with some things in common. We have the idea that we have this product backlog. And you can really think about these are items we want to do. And obviously those come from essentially, well, we have those customers who feed in requirements. So those things we have in common, let's just kind of draw a dotted line as we'll separate where those things differ. Now, a key part of both of those, big list of features that the product owner wants, and they're both gonna have stages we go through. And something in common with all of these is we pull. We have a certain kind of capacity and we pull items from the previous stage. We never push items into the next stage. Hey, I have capacity, I'm gonna go and get something that is available to me. Now, when I think about Scrum, what really you, you'll nearly always hear about with Scrum is the idea that I have a sprint. Now a sprint is a duration of work. It's typically one to four weeks. I think two weeks is fairly typical. And the way we really think about this working is the team that is part of this, they can do a certain amount of work. Uh, maybe they can do 10 points of work. So what happens is the items in the product backlog, they, they kind of assign points to based on how much work it's going to take. Hey, this one is two points, this one is three points, that one is one point, etc. So at the start of the sprint, so we think, okay, we have this sprint. They have a meeting. So we meet. And the whole team, the goal here is they agree. They pick the high priority items, things that are going to provide the most value. Again, that's the key point. That's what's the priority that they believe they can do in that sprint. Sprint as that defined time. They assign a point of work they can do. They look at the items and they're going to bring those items in. So they pull things in into, in this case, a sprint backlog. So they take items from the product backlog and bring them in based on, hey, I can handle up to 10 points of work, whatever that might be. 
Now it might be these are kind of big user stories, and we might break those into smaller tasks. We don't want them too small because it just clogs everything up, but we're going to break those out. Now within the sprint, there are then phases, just like we have. We have a build phase, maybe a test phase, and that I say build slash develop. A test phase, a deploy phase. And the whole goal is, hey, we pull things into here. Because, hey, I've done that piece of work. I have, a, I have capacity I can use. OK, the testing person has finished. OK, so they pull something that's finished from the build so they can start testing. The deploy person, hey, we, we pull something in that's been tested that we can do. So this takes place over that period of time. And then at the end of it, they kind of go and have another meeting at the end. So we have another kind of sprint meeting. What did we learn? What worked? What didn't work? Uh, where were their backlogs? And this is always a pull motion. We're never pushing things in. That's really kind of a key point to the whole sprint thing. So we have this idea, we have that framework, we're pulling things in constantly. So they, they move through, we have those constant learnings. That's kind of really a, a key point. Now also there are other things you may see as part of this process. For example, um, it's very common, actually across both of these, but you might hear about kind of a, a daily stand-up meeting. And the reason it's called a daily stand-up meeting is everyone has to stand up. Why do you have to stand up? Because it's 15 minutes max. By making people stand up, they're not going to want to talk for that long. If people are sitting down and they're comfy and they're having a donut and a drink, they'll waffle on and chat for as long as they feel like it. If they're standing up and they're kind of uncomfortable and they're like, oh God, I just want to sit down, they're going to get to the point. So we have a daily stand-up meeting to just quickly sink on where we are, if there's any challenges, then we kind of get back to that work. And then again, at the end of the sprint, they meet, they realign, they shift. They can do that. And that's one of the benefits here. Because it's a fixed duration, at the end of the sprint, they're kind of starting fresh again. They could completely realign. They could completely change anything they're doing. Now, one of the things you, you'll hear about sometimes, and I think, again, this could be in kind of common, is you, you have this notion, I've heard this called two pizza teams. Now I think that's very, very subjective. Uh, I will eat a whole pizza on my own, as we'll talk about in a second. I'm assuming these are really, really large pizzas, or it would be a team of two, but you don't want teams bigger than I can feed with two pizzas. Again, you want that close collaboration, and, and the bigger it gets, the more unwieldy that kind of gets, and it's really harder to get what we're trying to do. The key point, scrum. I have sprints, fixed duration. At the start, I pull in an amount of work that I believe I can do based on pointing. It still moves through phases, and I'm still gonna track this. I still might have a board, which we're gonna to come to in a second, where I move these bits. I go and look at what's available. I'm a tester, I finish my testing. Okay, I need to go and pull something that's finished in build. These might absolutely be divided up into kind of doing and done. You might see that very commonly. So I'm always, I'm always pulling something from the previous stage. Developers never pushing it to test. That's the key point of this whole motion. Okay, so that's Scrum, Sprints, all good. Kanban. Kanban is different. Instead of a fixed duration, it's continuous. So it is just a continuous stream of work. Now you could argue, if I think about, well, it's just continuous then, it's harder to completely realign, because there is no end window. If I decide I want to completely change what I'm doing, that's actually a bit harder with Kanban because there's always things in motion. There isn't a point where everyone has stopped. That can also be a benefit. But we still need to make sure we're not getting some huge accumulation in any one portion of our stream. So what we have is we have this 
work in progress limit or WIP. That's critical to this working. Because what we're gonna now do is, it's actually gonna look very, very similar. It's that methodology of how we arrange the work. I still have kind of a build phase. I still have a test phase. I still have a deploy phase. But the way we protect it is we have a work in progress limit the maximum number of items that can be in any one stage. So for build, maybe we say I can only ever have three things in build at any one time. In testing, maybe I say I can never have more than two. So these kind of slots we're allowed to fill. Maybe deployment, I say that's three as well. So once again, hey, if I'm at build and I only have two items, I can pull something from here. So now I've got three things filled up. Hey, if I'm in tests and I've completed testing and it's now deployed, pulled it out, I've got a spare slot, or maybe I've got my doing and done again, so maybe I have an extra slot. How I arrange this can vary. I would pull something from build. Deploy would pull something that's completed out of test. So if those same ideas, we pull when have space. That's the key point really for all of these. I'm always, it's always a pull motion from the previous phase when I'm ready. And that work in progress makes sure I don't have 50 items sitting in test. Because I still want to make sure things can move through fairly rapidly. What I don't want, because then it's about agility and being able to respond, is I have 50 things just waiting in test. And then, hey, I have some new requirement come in. Well, maybe build can take it, then it's gonna sit behind 50 other items for nine weeks. I don't want that. I still want this total time of this cycle from something coming in to exiting to be a couple of weeks. So I, I do really think about sort of time entry to exit, I want it to be weeks, not longer than that. And that whip ensures that. It makes sure I don't have some huge bottleneck at some point that everything will just get queued behind. So it's super important that I, I have that as part of that overall solution. So when I, when I think about, okay, that whip limit, there's no time box, it's just this ongoing thing. People pick up capacity as we go through. I mentioned Kanban was multiple things. So Kanban is actually really old. I think it started in Toyota factories as a method to make the manufacturing more efficient. So it's a very lean process. That's kind of a key point. And Kanban is actually a Japanese word for, I don't know if it's visual signal or signboard, but it's all about that visualization. So we think about Kanban is all about that way to visualize the work. Having Kanban cards, an item from that product backlog, which again, I could break up into different um, tasks, if need be, if it was too big, that's gonna move between the stages. And as a team, I could have an actual physical board where I have like, maybe post-it notes and I move them between. It could be a tool. Now, an example of that, and I just kind of threw this together for a bit of fun, this could be a Kanban board that I might use for my video creation. Now this is Azure DevOps. GitHub has a similar idea. It's not quite as rich today. And you can see I've kind of got my product backlog on the, the left over here. You can see I've got kind of my researching. So I, have, and again, the columns themselves can be different. I name them what makes sense. So for me, I have to go and research the topics. So we can say, okay, yeah, I'm researching Windows 365 overview and a DevOps Masterclass 2. I've drafted, actually I've finished drafting, so I say eight. My recording, I can have one thing. So notice these numbers in the top. I'm allowed to have, these are my work in progress limits. I'm allowed to have three things researching, two things drafting. I'm allowed one thing recording. Well, my recording has, I'm available. So I can actually pull this over because I'm actually recording this class as we speak. 
so I can actually move this to recording at this point. Now I can customize kind of what all these different things mean. So I can rename them, I can configure different things so I can see, hey, recording, actually my user story is not resolved, so I can change what does it mean. It's still active. So I can save and close that. So now my recording, oh, I kind of messed that up a little bit, but now that's actually gone back over to somewhere. And it did warn me, but now, so that's, if I actually change as backlog, there's my masterclass one, so it's gone to resolved. But I can actually go and look at that. This is obviously not my focus for this particular thing, but I could change that back to active, save, and there it is again. I'll move this back into recording, so it's still active. But you can see, hey, I'm pulling things over. And now drafting has spaces. Maybe if I'm ready and there was kind of a done, I could pull one of these over. Because sometimes someone's not ready to pull it straight away, but I want to be able to signal to them, well, I am finished. So on all of these different things, I could actually, notice here there's a split column into doing and done. So if I save that, now my drafting is the same shared whip limit but if I finish drafting saying I could move it to done, so that signals to the person doing the recording, hey, I could pull from that done column when I have capacity. So that's something I can do. So this is a Kanban board. Now notice this board, I might absolutely use with Scrum as well. This style of board would absolutely maybe make sense. But this idea of the work in progress limit is absolutely critical. That's what stops me overloading. And here's where I can go and say, hey, my work in progress limit. This is what's gonna make this process work. Without the whip, uh, it, it, it could just have a huge mass of things just bottlenecking at a certain point, which makes it very hard for me to then actually get things through as my requirements change. So I'm actually gonna change that drafting back to not split, just so it looks better for what I'm doing. But you get the idea. So that, that is a Kanban board. And you could see, hey, I could absolutely use that on Scrum as well. That same thing would absolutely apply. Now, Kanban has a whole number of principles. And I guess we should kind of write these out. So if I think about for a second, what matters to Kanban? So a key part here is start how you work. Don't have to do some massive change initially. Start with how you work. And do incremental evolutionary change. Rome wasn't built in a day, nor does my shift to this. Respect roles. Every role has a place. Understand what that role does. Leadership from all. Likewise, accept input from everyone on the team. I want to think about that visualization. This is the key point. It's a visual system of things moving over that board. Limit the whip. The work in progress is critical. Again, without the work in progress, time from entry to exit could be huge and it becomes worthless because I might get some new high priority item added, well, that's fine, I can reprioritize and I'll grab it on the next available build slot, but if then it gets stuck somewhere, it's gonna take months to move through. I don't want that. I wanna limit the amount of work that's in progress so people aren't just sitting there wondering what to do and nothing constructive gets done. We want meaningful work to be happening on any item that's part of our Kanban board that's actually in progress. I want it to be meaningful, not just stuck behind a whole bunch of different stuff. Always pull. We don't push something to testing. Testing have an empty space. They finish testing something, and maybe it's in there done. They have an empty slot. They will pull something that I've developed the code for. I don't tell them, hey, you go and test. So we're managing the flow. I want good definitions. Everyone has to be in agreement of what those different stages, those columns are, so we are working collaboratively because we want to improve that collaboration. 
That really is kind of a, a key point to everything we're going to do. So use and focus on the principles. Just using a board doesn't mean you're doing Kanban. It means I'm doing a Kanban board and I've got notes. But if I'm like, oh, I finished building, I'm moving it to test, that's not the point. They have to be pulling those things, want to collaborate, understand what they mean together. So understand the core principles. If I have bandwidth and I'm working in a particular stage, I pull something that's available that I can now work on. Those teams might be cross-skilled. So if I find, you know, I really have nothing to do, maybe I can help out and I can help maybe on another stage to so keep the things running. Now, still with these, we still probably can have meetings periodically. You might still have those stand-up meetings. We're still going to have meetings where we discuss what's working, what's not working. We'll be able to see where there's bottlenecks because when we have those communications, if Tess is saying, for example, I'm just sitting here, I've got nothing to do, well, building. Now, realistically, building is going to take typically the most amount of time. But maybe, hey, we need more development resources. Um, or if we find things are just sitting in test deploys taking too long, we need more deployment resources. So we can use these things to understand. So we always pull, kind of highlight that, when we have space, and we can help actually go and see when there are actual things we can do, etc. And again, Kanban, boards could absolutely be used by Scrum. They still move in items. And we actually saw in Azure DevOps, Azure DevOps will actually let you specify, am I using Scrum? Um, each of these items, you actually see I've got points. I did that just for fun, but I can assign points to the different user stories that I have. And if a user story is too big, like my master class, for example, well, that's actually made up of multiple classes. So if I look at it as a backlog, so you can see, hey, these are all my user stories, but I also have work items. And I have a DevOps masterclass epic. So this is a big, all-encompassing, bigger initiative that you can see down the bottom here has child items. So you can see it has child items, masterclass one and two, and actually, it should also have a link to, it has another child, Masterclass 3. So I can actually create these bigger narrative, these bigger things I'm trying to do as an organization for my product, but it doesn't make sense to try and do all of that as one item of work. So I break it down into individual user stories that I can have those digestible kind of bites out of and actually make progress with. That, that's kind of a, a key thing that we want to be able to actually go and leverage. Okay, so those are really kind of the key difference. We want those key things we can buy. You can mix them together. You will see people that are Scrum that are moving to Kanban. I think there's actually a Scrum ban where it's a mixture of Scrum and Kanban. Whatever works. The key point of this, you don't have to be super rigid necessarily. What works for your team and how you deliver, but as long as you all agree on that and it works, so be it. Change is never easy. Start small. Look for pain points. Look for teams that are willing and want change. Introduce the change with them. Start with something that's small enough that I can actually make some real progress in a relatively short amount of time. I want to win. I want a hero win that I can then demonstrate the value of this to the rest of my company. Then build on that success. Again, you're not going to change overnight. People always hate change. Um, get the showcase win, show the value, and then kind of build from there. Now, all of this Kanban and Scrum can kind of be a little bit confusing. So, I want to talk about pizza. That'd be the second time I've mentioned pizza in this. I love pizza. Pizza, is, I think, is my favorite food. And I was actually planning this out, the drafting, and it was Friday night. Every Friday night for me and my household is Grimaldi's night. Fantastic pizza, um, brick oven pizza, awesome. As I was thinking about it, I was ordering the pizza, it occurred to me, 
it's actually a fantastic example of Kanban. So I actually went and picked up the pizza, I take it home, and I took a picture. It was kind of awkward, they were kind of looking at me like, what are you doing, why are you taking a picture of us? But it's a great, great example. So I think about it, I phone up, okay? I phone up and I place my order. Now, I actually took the ticket. It's actually my kid's pizza. 12 inch cheese, half pepperoni, no basil, light cook, okay? So this essentially, if I think about Kanban, is a Kanban card. It's, it's, a, it's an item of work. And this requirement from a customer would actually go to their product backlog. So that wheel that they have there of all the pizzas to be made would sit on there. You can see they've kind of got those tickets. So it would get added to that. So if I, for a second, take that, let's go back. Okay, so that was Kanban. Now let's think about something closer to my heart. Something that I, I really care about, I can get behind. So I am now gonna think about pizza. Kanban. I'll be more enthusiastic. So I have still a product backlog. Remember that little circular thing with the tickets. Please. On there. Now remember, a key point of this, this ticket also has the requirements. So this ticket has the requirements on it. So it's kind of a, a 12 inch cheese, no basil, yuck, anything green, etc. And those come from the customer, me. And they're sending in their requirements. And it really is me, there's, there's no hair on that picture. Now, in terms of the restaurant, let's think about it. So we have the product backlog, that big wheel. But this is a phenomenal idea behind it. So someone actually took the order, customer, and added it to the product backlog. Now the people actually cooking the pizzas have stations. They maybe have four slots that they can actually make pizzas at. So if I think about the flow of this, well, I have the ability to make pizza, actually construct them. They have a finite amount of space actually on their table. So maybe there's, this is where they can make pizzas. Maybe there's four spaces. So what that gives them there actually is a whip limit, a work in progress limit of four. They can only be making four pizzas. Now maybe that's a doing and they also have a done. Maybe they have a little done space over here as well. Maybe they can store two pizzas. Maybe they have a whip limit of two for done, so the total whip limit would be six. So whenever they have a space, what do they do? They pull. They pull a ticket that is a next priority item. So imagine as a customer, I got the wrong pizza, or it had basil on it. Um, that would be a high priority. They would pull that off the product backlog and make that pizza next. Now, back to the picture. Okay, so they've made it. The oven is next. The oven has a finite amount of space in it. So I can think, okay, well then they have to cook the pizza. So then we have cook. And once again, the oven, got the fire, it has a finite number of spaces in the oven. Maybe it has a whip limit of, let's say, nine. And maybe once again, there's kind of a spare done of a single space. They can put a pizza, so there's a whip, whip limit there. So maybe it's a 10 is the total whip limit. When they're done, well, someone has to actually go and check the pizzas and cut it and box it. And maybe there, there's just two stations, there's two people. So that has a whip limit of two. And then from there, it either goes to the table where people are sitting to eat, or maybe it's being picked up. So it's kind of a warm up, but essentially it's been delivered. So 
So always, it's a pull action. The person who's doing the oven pulls from the done. The people making the pizza never throw it at the person who's putting the pizzas in. The check-in box people take it from kind of that done. It's always a pull that way. And then the, the waiters, the waitresses, take it from the done that are boxed up. It's always pulled between those various sections. And that's kind of a really, really important point when we think about that. So I actually think it's a, a really nice idea. So those whip limits really do control the pizza kitchen. Because again, what I wouldn't want is to have no limits and they just start stacking up pizzas here that are cooked and they're getting cold. Or they're stacking up here and they're just going bad because they need to be put in the oven. Also, if there was just a huge number of pizzas stuck at one stage, if there was a reorder coming, a high priority, it would take ages to move through. So by having these work in progress limits, it makes sure if there is a priority order coming, it can still move through in maybe a 10 minute time window. It's never gonna get stuck behind because there's so much queued up. So I think a pizza restaurant actually has a really good job of really showing the idea of a Kanban board. They, they are a Kanban board. This ticket, my ticket, moves through the station. It follows. They take the order, it goes on the board. They tuck it under the bit of wood as they're making the pizza. I don't quite understand how they put it in the oven, but somehow it still follows through. It goes in the box and then it gets delivered to me. So the pizza moves through all of the stages. I take the pizza, I deliver it, and then there's me eating my tasty, tasty pizza every Friday without fail. So you can see the kind of importance of those various things. Now, I guess you could, what, you could argue actually, okay, John, so that was Kanban. How would this look if it was Scrum? So you could say, well, the, the stages would actually be the same. So if I now went to a scrum idea of the pizza, you still have the same product backlog with all the tickets on it. I would still have the same kind of make. I would still have the same kind of um, cook. I would have the same um, check and box. The difference would be I would have a sprint. And I would have maybe a 30 minute sprint. I'm going to make pizzas in a 30 minute block of time. So the difference would now be what I would do is I would have that kind of sprint backlog. And I might say in 30 minutes we can make 60 points of pizza. Now, depending on the pizza order, like an extra large, everything on it might be five points. A small cheese might be one point. Medium pizza, two points. They would take tickets that they're going to make in that next sprint. That's the priority. So Kanban, you're prioritizing every time. Kanban, every time they have a space, they're looking at the product backlog and taking the next priority item. The manager can move things around and give things higher priorities, so it's the next one taken. That process in the sprint, in the scrum model, can only take place at the start. They're pulling all of the tickets they're gonna do in that next 30 minutes. And then it would look the same. They're gonna, oh, okay, we'll take these and make them. Then we'll pull, they're still, it's all still a pull motion there to the customer. At the end of the 30 minutes, they would say, what went well? Okay, well, okay, we're a bit slow doing this part. We need someone else cooking. It's harder to react. Mid sprint, I, I really can't. Like an urgent order came in, I have to wait to the end of the sprint so I can really do something. But I know I'm gonna get this many pizzas made in that sprint. It's easy to plan out. So if I look at sort of scrum, because we have these set duration sprints, because we have these units of work I can do, I can actually plan out further in advance. I can absolutely say, hey, okay, I know I'm gonna make this many pizzas in this sprint, 
I know I have this many, it's gonna take me an hour and a half to clear this complete order. I can plan well out in advance. Whereas with the Kanban, because it's continuous, it can be a little bit harder for long, long-term things to plan out, work out exactly when they're happening, but I can definitely react faster because it is continuous. At any point, I can kind of, hey, there's a gap, I'll take the new requirement that's come in, I will start processing that one. So that, that made sense, I really just wanted to be able to talk about pizza. Um, but I think that's kind of a, a really good analogy actually for Kanban. I think it relates well when I actually think about doing those things. So I spent a bit more time on that than other things we'll talk about today, but it was kind of an important point. So we wanted to make sure we did actually focus on that. So now, let's think about for a second, I've lost my remote. I already have lost my remote. The next slide, oh, it's under my ticket. So just quickly Git, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. If I'm gonna have this constant incremental value, it probably means I need new ways of working, new ways of testing, new ways of delivering. Now again, I'm gonna cover all of this. Next week is gonna be probably a really long lesson all about Git. I wanna do a master Git next week. But I'm gonna have people working on the same potential areas of code. They need to be able to bring that together constantly without locking each other out. In a traditional version control, I need version control. I need to be able to see what changed, who changed it, why. And traditionally, we would check out a file and no one else could change that file. And that's not gonna work well in these types of things. So I need to be able to track what changed. I'm gonna maybe have the same file change for different region, reasons. I have a bug I need to fix. I have a new feature. I have a new release. Same file might be changed in different ways. How do we handle that? So a Git-based solution is actually perfect for that. We use this Git for source version control that enables that concurrent development. So when I think about, let's actually scroll back out for a second. We'll go back over, we'll go back over to here. So what I want to think is, let's zoom in, there we go. So we have a Git, I have an idea of a repository. So we have this Git repo. Now, and the common kind of symbol for Git is kind of this. And it's really showing the idea of branches. Hey, the code goes in different directions, but we can bring them back together. Now, an important part, Git does not mean GitHub. Git is a, a standard, it's a tool set that I can use through version control. I can use it just entirely locally on my machine. But I have this repository. And I can store different things in there. I can store text files, I can store images, I can store artifacts. There's different things I can do with that. But a key point, it, it is a distributed system. So if I think about it, Git repository has a whole bunch of code in it. Well, if I'm a developer over here, if I'm an IT operator over here, we all have a full copy of that repo on our machine. Completely full. All of the files, the same size. And what we do is we commonly, we're gonna sync it to that common shared copy. So a big deal with this, it is distributed. I have a complete copy of the entire repository on my local machine. Now, when we talk about this next week, I'll talk about how hashes are used to make sure no one can change anything, so I can track everything that changed. We can still be assured of all of that, but essentially, it's fully distributed. I can change any file I want. And then through very powerful mechanisms, even if someone changed the same file, I can merge them back together. I can find conflicts. I can resolve them very easily. Now, what I do want is this central copy. If I'm collaborating, I want that central copy. This is where you will hear about things like GitHub. Um, obviously, Azure DevOps is a big solution. Um, Bitbucket, I mean, there's a whole number of solutions. There's not a right or wrong. Use what works for you and your company. But I'm gonna demo mostly GitHub. But again, uh, there's Azure DevOps repos, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of those kind of central Git repositories. So, everyone has their own copy, fantastic. 
challenge with that is if everyone's got their own copy and syncing them, it's really important there's not big long gaps between syncing them and bringing the code back together to make sure someone's not introduced a bug or an incompatibility. Now we're using loose coupling, we're doing these good things, but if multiple people are changing the same files, still problems could occur. So we need to make sure that it doesn't happen. So you want to integrate each person's changes in very, very frequently, maybe nightly. And we do that through kind of they, they commit the changes they've made so far to a certain branch. And we need to basically bring those in, build the solution, run some tests, and make sure the result is kind of what we expect. Maybe we go and create some output. So we have the idea of this continuous integration. So from here, yeah, I've got this Git repository, and what kind of happens is people will make commits. A commit is, hey, there's some unit of work that I have done. And so that will then build into this idea of continuous integration. CI. So that commit will likely trigger. Now, it doesn't have to be a commit. It could be some kind of schedule. But what we're going to have is a pipeline. That's supposed to be a pipeline. And the whole point of this is this is automated. Now, again, we think shift left. Ideally, there's going to be some kind of security straight away. Oh, we've checked in this code. Let's go and check some things. There's no secrets that have been put in the repo. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Um, I don't have something I shouldn't have. I'm not using a bad dependency. And then it does a build. This is all automated. Then maybe there's some automated tests it can perform. I can have some automated tests, or maybe there's some manual ones. Maybe then it goes and creates an image of some kind once it passes the test. And then maybe it uploads that image to some kind of registry. So this is just all happening automatically. And if there was a problem, we can even have this go and create a work item to say, hey, this test failed, or this check failed, or this security thing, hey, it's going to create a pull request and say you should have this dependency instead. So I can have those capabilities, but it's continuously integrating everyone's code. Yes, I'm working on my own distributed copy, but and this is, again, process. People need to make sure they check these things in. If someone doesn't do a commit for three months and then commits 1,000 changes, that's going to be a bad day. So again, part of the people process tools, process. Make sure you're frequently committing. And then we're going to have this continuous integration. We're constantly bringing everyone's changes together to make sure it's still behaving as we need it to. Okay, so that's checking everything is still good. Awesome. Then I need to think about, well, I want to continually bring that value. Maybe it's creating some XE or an image, a Docker image. Maybe it's an image for a scale set. Maybe it's a package, a Maver, an NPM, whatever that might be. I create something and then I need to deploy it and actually get used by something. So how do I then actually think about doing that? Well, once again, I want the idea of continuous delivery and maybe even continuous deployment. Now, obviously, I have to deploy this to something. So this is maybe created something, maybe uploaded to a registry, and I could, I could kind of think about that, maybe, hey, OK. So this pipeline went and did it to some registry somewhere, created something. So now I want to think about OK, I want this continuous delivery. So there's another pipeline. Now again, this pipeline, the trigger could be, hey, look, something new has been put in that registry. A new image has shown up. OK, we need to go and test it. That could be the trigger. Maybe it's a, an artifact, a new XE has shown up. Whatever that is. Now remember, I have to deploy to something. So maybe this is actually build or verify infrastructure. Do I have my Kubernetes environment there and ready? 
then maybe I actually go and, okay, deploy whatever the thing is. Deploy, I'll say artifact. Could be an image, could be an XE, don't know what that is. And then I, I have a test. At this point, I probably have a gate. Now, a gate can be many different things. A gate could be maybe a, a number of work items raised, i.e. bugs. It could be an approval. Maybe it's combined with a time window. But there's some delay. And then maybe it goes and repeats kind of these things. Maybe now it's a UAT infrastructure, deploy or validate. Then it's deploy the solution to UAT. And then maybe it's, again, there's some other thing. But all of this is kind of my continuous delivery. All the way through deploy UAT, test UAT. And again, this could be a manual approval. Maybe there's a test plan that humans have to go and do various things. So that's delivering the all up solution. And then what I can also have at this point is actually continuous deployment. Actually now getting it to production. So continuous delivery is about getting it ready and oh, it's good. I think about having a really big gate here, but then the pipeline could actually kind of continue to kind of prod infra, make sure it's good, prod deploy. And also there'd be a prod test. We still would do those kind of validation tests. So all those different kind of things going through. So the continuous deployment actually goes through and into production. Now, when I think about production, I'm not just going to deploy this. Like when I'm here, these types of things are all going to be about different types of deployment pattern. Very rarely would I just stick all of that in production. Maybe I have the idea, you might have heard of blue, green. The idea that I basically have two environments. And so I would deploy the new code to the green environment and then switch to make green production. If something goes wrong, I can switch them back very, very simply. Um, I might hear about things like Canary. So with Canary, I deploy it to a very small sampling of my users to see if any of them have a bad experience and complain. If I don't, I can expand it out. So maybe it's kind of 5% and then I deploy it to 15%, then 50%, then like 100%. And I'm waiting for people to complain. Maybe it's rings. Rings will be very similar. So I'm not so much waiting for a certain portion to complain. I just have these rings of deployment I follow. There's many other, there's, there's a whole ways to think about that deployment. But continuous deployment, I'm actually driving that value through. So if you look at the entire pattern, it's like, wow, the code comes in, it's continually integrated to make sure something's not broken. I, I want to find the problems early. Find them early and often. I don't want to wait a month. Someone did something, it broke something, who cares? I found it that day. I'm going to fix it before it becomes a big issue. Move on. But we're going to find it through continuous integration. I, hey, when we pass a certain gate, we've created an image, it got through all of these things, I can actually get those delivered out. So I can have the artifact ready to go to a production. And maybe I actually do continuous deployment to actually get it to production in an automated fashion. Again, gates to validate things, I use different patterns to get it out there. There's all different things I can do, but I can absolutely do those things. So I have that idea. I have to think about secret handling as well. So all those pipelines, there's tools to do that. Um, definitely. Good to do. I can check for secrets. I can look for some credential. But this really does come down to that kind of people process thing in, in a huge way. I'm going to stress this here. Never put secrets in your repos, in your code, 
in your config files? No secrets, no private keys, not hard coded in configuration files here. Never, ever, ever. What I do is I have a vault. Now in Azure, this would be Azure Key Vault. These are good at storing secrets. A secret is something I can read and write back. Could be like a shared access signature. I store my keys. A key is something I can't extract back out, but I can do cryptographic operations in the vault. So I can send it, hey, do this cryptographic operation. Create me this signature, validate this thing. Uh, maybe certificates, kind of life cycle management. That's where those things go. Now, I can bring those in to my pipelines. All of these pipelines run as a certain credential, so I can use role-based access control to control which secrets, which keys can be used by dev, UAT. I, I can control all of those things there. So it's really kind of a, an important point around that. So I'm never putting secrets in my repo. I'm always using a vault. Okay. Importance of monitoring. And I can kind of just, monitoring is always important. I want to make sure my production systems are running. They have enough resource. I may be doing scaling intelligently. Yes, always important there. But for DevOps, almost more important is monitoring of the interactions and that user behavior. I've talked about that already. We want to drive value and we have to make sure the value we drive is the priority value, where it's going to have the biggest bang for the buck, what's going to mean the most for my solution that differentiates me from my competitor. So I have to know what matters to the end user. Um, so what features are they using in the app through the service? What's getting called? When do they give up? This bit must be super painful. What features get used the most? Are there poor user experiences, very long delays? If I just look at the counters on a server, CPU and IOPS and network, I'm not going to see those things. The only way I can see those things is to actually get feedback from the user. So I potentially need new tools, new telemetry to actually be able to get that. So I think about, hey, my, my overall solution, all of this here, Yes, there, there would be things tracking through those things. But at the end of the day, there is some end user here. The, the customer. What is their experience? That's really what I care about. So I need feedback. Now that feedback could be in the terms of, especially in testing surveys. Hey, what did you like? What didn't, what didn't you like? But also there's gonna be maybe some device they're using, could be a phone, whatever. I kind of wanna be able to track telemetry of what paths they took. On the application, what functions are being called. I wanna be able to know those things to see what they like, what they don't like. On Azure, things like App Insights, I can hook into my application code. I can hook into the end user device, mobile platforms, to see what they're using to actually go and get that feedback. I have to have that. And additionally, when I think about monitoring, we're going to have a whole unit on this. There probably are key performance indicators, PKI definitions that I need to have to work out, am I working on the right things? I'm picking from that product backlog what I believe is driving value. Is it driving value? I need to know that. I might have KPIs. How often are we releasing? What is the deployment speed? How many deployments are we doing? How long does it take to release a new priority item? So something new shows up on that pizza twirly. How long does it take to actually get at the customer's table? What is the sentiment of the user population? Are they happy or getting happier? Or are they kind of getting fed up? Are we more efficient? How many admins do we have per customers? Uh, how many support calls are we getting? How used are the different parts of our application? How many bugs are being raised? Indication of quality. Are we meeting SLA, service level agreements? Ideal quality. 
What's the morale of our team? Is our team happy? Are our people leaving? Or are we retaining them? So what's the overall morale? So there's all these different interactions I really have to think about. So monitoring is key to everything. We're changing all these processes, remember, and making all these big changes, okay? I need to make sure it's of value. Is the customer happy? Are things performing well? As, as a, I've got customers in different places here. There's different ideas. There's like the business owner, there's maybe the end user's target, it could be different. Am I providing value? The team that's doing all of this stuff, how are they? Do they hate this? Is it improving their lives? Are they overstressed? I, I need to know and understand those things to really understand, is what I'm doing the right thing? Or do I need to reassess? A whole point of this is remember those continual learnings in those loops, where there's always that monitor and learn. We have to learn. We have, to, we have to take those steps. Okay, so last key thing. Infrastructure as code. So self-service is a key to agility. I talked about those pipelines and the idea that, hey, that I'm not waiting for some operator to click the button. It kind of just goes through. But I also talked about build and validating the environment. I don't want to create things through a portal. Portals, while intuitive, uh, I mean, they're just subject to error. I'm going to click the wrong thing. I do the wrong thing. I want it automated. So what we always think about is infrastructure as code. So I don't want to create via the portal. I want my infrastructure to be defined by some kind of code. Now, these are typically declarative and item potent. This is what I want it to look like. I'm not telling you how to do it. And I can just keep rerunning that. If it already matches, great. It won't change anything. I'm going to use them actually in my pipelines. So if I go back to my picture kind of over here, I could absolutely think about, okay, I have my infrastructure as code. Now that infrastructure could be a storage account. It could be a Kubernetes environment. It could be a bunch of VMs. Whatever that is, I have my infrastructure as code. Now, that's got a whole bunch of resources it's defined. This could be a JSON file. It could be a YAML file, things like Kubernetes. It could be a bicep file if it was Azure specific. But the key point, it is declarative. It is item potent. I can keep rerunning the same template. It's not going to error. If it's already deployed, then it's just going to match. I think that's what declarative wrong. It's an A. Terrible speller. This is a key property. It's prescriptive. It's going to look this way. I can, I can source control this thing. It's JSON, it's YAML. So because it's kind of textual, well, I can actually store that in my Git repo. It's not some special unique butterfly. It will be in my Git repo for my project, the same as everything else. So I'm not doing anything kind of special around there. And it is human readable. And because it's declarative, saying what I want the desired state to be, it makes it I can audit it very easily. Because, hey, does it match what is deployed? So I can demonstrate, yes, we have had this configuration which is required. And from these, hey, I can push out resources to the cloud. I could push out something to a Kubernetes environment. That's supposed to be a steering wheel. I, I can't draw that at all. It could push out to things like an operating system. I could use Chef, Puppet, PowerShell, DSC. There's all different things. I could create Docker files, composition files. These could be um, YAML files for Kubernetes. I'll talk about it in a second. I can also do things like GitOps. So GitOps is the idea that I can just point my, for example, Kubernetes cluster to a repo. And every time there's a commit made, it will actually go and pull down the changes and apply them. So again, those YAML files are all stored in the repo and through things like Flux and Helm. Helm is really just a structured um, combination of multiple YAML files that make up a complete solution. I just have to once deploy my new desired state, 
and all my Kubernetes clusters will just go and pull those things down straight away. This single template defines an entire service. Now I could have smaller kind of um, kind of parameter files that might be environmental specific. So I have a dev one, I might have a UAT one, a prod. But the actual template itself is the same. I could use that in completely different applications. They can all share those things. And so all of these files, when I talk about build a very fine infrastructure, I'm doing that with my declarative files. Every time we see that validate infrastructure in all of the pipelines, I'm using an infrastructure's code to actually do that. All of these things really come together. That's kind of the, the key point in what we're doing on this. So talk about GitOps, we're gonna have a whole lesson on GitOps as well. Getting ready. So that was all the topic I wanted to cover. There was a lot of stuff I know. There is nothing cloud specific. There is no tool specific really about this. I want to talk about the principles and the ideas behind it. I am an Azure person. Go and get Visual Studio Code, it's free. Cross-platform, Linux, Mac OS, Windows. I'm gonna be demoing a lot of things in that. Go and get, get. Um, again, it's available cross-platform. I can use Git entirely on my local machine. I don't have to have any kind of server. I can have a complete repository on my, my machine. I'm an Azure person. I'm gonna demo when I deploy things to Azure. If you have a different cloud you use, use that. Not gonna make any difference. If you don't have anything, you can get a free Azure um, subscription. It gives you a bucket of money you can use, I think for the first 30 days. And there's some, some services that are free for a year. There are some that are free always. So go and sign up. You can go and sign up for a free GitHub account. So one of the nice things, I'll actually show this quick. So there's different GitHub plans, but for free, I can have unlimited number of public and private repos. There's a number of automation minutes, package storage, issues and projects, community support at zero dollars. So I think we can all likely do that. And likewise for Azure DevOps as well. So if I go and jump to the Azure DevOps link, and all these links are actually in the, the description, and I'm, these are actually more about the GitOps repo. I'll have all these things. Azure DevOps is actually free for the first five people. So again, if we go and look at the pricing, there's stuff I can get individually, but notice the first five users are free in any company. Like if they have MSDN, they don't even count out of those five. So I can actually go and start using this, even with a, create a couple of accounts, so I can show things working together. I can go and create that thing. So go and sign up, so I've got these tools available. Most of my focus when I'm talking about tooling, again, will be GitHub and Azure DevOps, but again, there are other solutions. You don't have to use these, these are just what I'm more familiar with, so I'll demo on those. It's the concepts that matter and those get ups, those concepts are fairly universal across different solutions. So that was it. Um, any questions about this lesson, please post below. Please don't say when's the next one coming out. I'm gonna probably try and live on a weekly cadence. There'll be times I won't, because I'm gonna do a different topic about a certain technology in between. But for the most part, I'm gonna try and do one of these a week. Um, comments about this content below huge amount of work to create this so please please like subscribe and share and uh, until next lesson take care